رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد إن شاء الله we will start by talking about the merits of fasting about فضائل الصيام the merits of fasting fasting was mentioned in the Quran a few times and Allah سبحانه وتعالى in سورة الأحزاب describes the believers with a number of descriptions or number of traits Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما So Allah mentions a few descriptions of the believers and among them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions والصائمين والصائمات They are the ones that observe the fast Males and females They observe the fast So observing the fast is one of the main descriptions of believers because it's such a great act of worship and we know obviously that Sawm Ramadan, fasting Ramadan is one of the pillars of Islam one of the pillars of Islam that our Islam stands upon stands upon these pillars so if someone, someone doesn't observe the fast there's a serious issue with their faith a serious issue with their faith and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the verses that talk about fasting وَأَنْتَ صُومُ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ and if you fast, it is better for you if you know. Here Allah is talking about the people who are exempted. Or at the beginning, fasting, by the way, uh, when, the, when the first verse was revealed, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ All you who believe, fasting has been prescribed upon you. Just as it was prescribed upon the people who came before you, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may attain taqwa. You may attain taqwa. أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودَاتٍ You know, for a number of days. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ So those who are ill or physically unable, or those who are traveling, so they can make up whatever they miss later on, after Ramadan, afterwards. And we know obviously if someone is sick or someone is traveling, they are exempt from fasting. They can, they can choose. If they can fast and they are able to do it, fine, but they are exempt from fasting. Uh, but they have to make up whatever days they miss. فَعِدَّةُ مِنْ أَيَامٍ أُخَرْ وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ Now, and those who are able to do it, that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونُهَا And those who are able to handle fasting with difficulty. And this was revealed about older people. If they fasted, it would be difficult for them, but it would not jeopardize or risk their life or their health. But it would be extremely difficult for them. Or people who were sick, suffering some, from some kind of disease, and if they fasted, it would be very difficult for them, but there would be no risk on their health, no serious consequences. So, at the beginning, these people were exempt from fasting. They wanted, this is why Allah subhanahu wa says, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ So they can pay a fidya, expiation, which is feed one poor person. Give them a full meal. Offer them a full meal. So because these people were allowed, and this is not, as I said, this is a mild sickness, it just makes fasting a little bit more difficult. Or old age that makes fasting a little bit difficult, but not impossible or not extremely exhausting to the body. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the beginning, He exempted these people, allowed them. But then later on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only exempted the people who are traveling and the people who are sick, who when they fast, is going to, exacerbate their medical condition or make things extremely hard for them. Uh, so only those people were able to pay the fidya or, to, or sorry to fast later on. But the people who were unable completely to fast like due to old age and fasting would risk their life or risk, risk their health and have serious consequences. Those are the only ones who were exempt from fasting at the end. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said for then Allah says, وَأَنْ تَصُومُوا خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ 
So you can opt to not fasting and pay the fidya if it's a little bit difficult for you. But if you fast, it is better for you. So fasting is better than the fidya. That shows that fasting has a profound merit. And now we can move on to look at the hadith of the Prophet wasallam with regards to the merit of fasting. So Allah says to, to us that you fast is better for you. So that shows there's a lot of goodness in fasting. The Prophet ﷺ indicated that fasting is a protection, is a shield that protects us. It's an act of worship, but at the, at the, it's also a profound shield and protection that saves us from falling into a lot of bad things. For example, the Prophet ﷺ says when he is addressing uh, the younger ones among the Ummah and the hadith collected by Al-Bukhari and Muslim, he says, Ya ma'ashar al-shabab. من استطاع منكم الباءة فليتزوج فإنه أغض للبصر وأحسن للفرج ومن لم يستطع فعليه بالصوم فإنه له وجاء The Prophet says, all oh young people, get married. Get married. Because it, it will help you lower your gaze and it will help you protect your private parts so you don't commit zina. You don't commit zina. But as for those who are unable to marry, then let them hold on to fasting. فَإِنَّهُ لَهُ وِجَاءَ وِجَاءَ is incarceration. That means it kills the desire. Fasting kills the sexual desire. Why? Because sexual desire is usually, you know, piles up or builds up within the body. When the body is is at ease when the body is at ease so you're having enough food uh, you don't have a lot of physical exertion and so on and so forth so you have lots of energy in the body now the body could at this time the body usually develops this kind of sexual desire but fasting takes away a lot of that physical energy by not provide, providing so much nutri nutrients during the day so this is why the person does not feel the same level of sexual urge, the same level of sexual urge. And this is why they say overeating, you know, increases your sexual desire. The more you eat, you find a need to, you know, sexually or to become sexually active. But when you abstain from eating and drinking for a whole day, this actually lessens your sexual desire. And the Prophet ﷺ, Bo, uh, he, he mentioned here and some kind of a metaphor. He said it's like incarceration. Incarceration obviously is when you cut off the private parts of certain animals, right? So that means they don't have any sexual desire at all. So fasting in a sense is similar to this. It's not to the same extent, but it lessens to a great deal the sexual desire. So it shows that it's actually a protection. So the Prophet is giving advice to the young people who are unable to marry to hold on to fasting because that is, inshallah, a guarantee to lower the levels of their sexual desire. There is something, by the way, that's a practical thing. Uh, <clears throat> for people who overeat when they open their fast after Maghrib, and they overeat during the night, and for suhoor, the, the uh, pre-dawn meal, the benefits of fasting in that sense will not be full. Will not be full. Because imagine if you are eating two full meals and you overeat during them, uh, still your body is getting a lot of energy. And you will experience the sexual desire. So when the Prophet is talking about fasting, he's talking about fasting when you observe the etiquettes of fasting as well, that you do not overeat. The problem with, that's a very general problem, it's very common unfortunately among the Muslims, is that as if we are taking revenge when we open our fast. Like we are avenging ourselves. I've deprived myself of eating for 16 hours. Now I'm going to teach, I don't know who, a lesson. So I'm going to destroy you know, the plate in front of me. Or not even a plate, it's a platter of food. So that's a serious issue. Because you do away with, the, with a lot of the benefits of fasting. Fasting gives you a lot of mental clarity gives you a lot of balance, it helps your body heal as well. These benefits of fasting, when you overeat, when you open your fast, or when you have suhoor, that takes away a lot of these benefits. 
So if you still overeat at iftar and at suhoor, you're not going to get this kind of effect that fasting gives, which is lessening and lowering the, the intensity of the sexual desire. You're not going to get this. This is why sometimes people fast and they say, I don't experience you know, any change in my sexual desire. I still feel the same urges. Yes, because you're still overeating. You're still overeating. But when you have a, a balanced kind of iftar and a balanced kind of suhoor, you're going to reap a lot of the benefits of fasting. A lot. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, now we're going to explore a hadith that show and that indicate that fasting is a protection. So it's a protection from sexual desire. And when you have less sexual desire, you are less prone to give a free play to your eyes to look around at women. Because when we gaze at women, this is usually in, uh, in accordance with the intensity of our sexual desire. And it also heightens it at the same time. It's more of a vicious cycle. So when you lessen your sexual desire, you're less prone to look at women. You're less tempted to look at women. So the Prophet ﷺ says in this authentic hadith, also reported by Al-Bukhari Muslim, he says, مَا مِنْ عَبْدٍ يَصُومُ يَوْمًا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا بَعَدَ اللَّهُ بِذَلِكَ وَجْهَهُ عَنِ النَّارِ سَبْعِينَ خَرِيفًا There is no servant that fasts one day for the sake of Allah, except that Allah will distance his face from the hellfire by a distance that is counted by 70 years. 70 years. So that shows that fasting is a protection from the hellfire. It protects you from the hellfire. Fasting itself distances you from the hellfire. So it's worth that you do it. Specifically with the obligatory fast in Ramadan. But it's also an invitation to fast even outside of Ramadan. And the Prophet ﷺ says in another authentic hadith, As-siyamu junna, yastajinnu biha al-abdu min al-nar. This is reported by Imam Ahmad and the other sunan, and it's authentic. As-siyamu junna, junna means protection. Junna is protection or a shield. As-siyamu junna, yastajinnu biha al-abdu min al-nar. The person or the servant protects himself from the hellfire by means of this shield, by means of fasting. So that shows that fasting really protects us from the hellfire. And the Prophet ﷺ says, in this hadith reported in a sunan as well, he says, مَنْ صَامَ يَوْمًا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ النَّارِ خَنْدَقًا كَمَا بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ The one who fasts, any servant who fasts a day for the sake of Allah, Allah will place between him and the hellfire a trench. A trench. Again, it's a protection. And this trench or the width of this trench is like the distance between the heavens and the earth. By fasting one day for the sake of Allah. This includes fasting in Ramadan and outside Ramadan. So that shows when you are engaged in fasting, don't think it's just a simple act of worship. You abstain from food and drink and sexual desire. No, you are doing something profound, an act of profound nature that truly distances you. And when the Prophet ﷺ says distances you, it literally does. This is not just a metaphor, it's a reality. It's a reality. You are getting more distant from the hellfire when you fast. You place more protection and shields between you and the hellfire when you fast one day. So imagine the more you fast for the sake of Allah, how much you're getting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another merit of fasting is that fasting leads you to paradise. It takes you to paradise. The Prophet ﷺ, a, a companion came to him, Abu Umama radiallahu anhu. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, قُلْتُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ دُلَّنِي عَلَىٰ عَمَلٍ أَدْخُلُ بِهِ الْجَنَّةِ He said, oh, Allah's Messenger, tell me about an act of worship or something that I do and by means of this act I enter paradise. So tell me about something that if I do, it will lead me to paradise. The Prophet ﷺ straight away said to him, عَلَيْكَ بِالصَّوْمِ لَا مِثْلَ لَهُ He said, hold on to fasting. Then what you're asking about is fasting. لا مثل له. There is nothing like it. There is nothing like it. So when you are fasting, you're doing something that has in no similarities with any other act of worship. Its excellence is, not, is unmatched by anything else. 
the Prophet is saying, he, he's asking the Prophet tell me about something that I do to enter paradise, something that will take me to paradise. The Prophet says, fasting. Hold on to fasting. There is nothing like it. There is nothing like it. So nothing will get you into paradise in terms of acts of worship like fasting. Obviously, now you're talking about a companion, he so observes, observes the prayer. So that's a given. That's a given. Someone says, oh, is fasting better than the prayer? This kind of thinking is faulty. This kind of thinking is faulty, by the way. Sometimes this is why we need, when we approach Islam, we have to have a holistic kind of approach. It's impossible for people to communicate if I'm going to, you know, have a clause at the end of every sentence I say. If I say, like, look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he's saying to this companion, hold on to fasting, there is nothing like it. The companion didn't say, even the prayer? Well, that's obvious. There's nothing like the prayer in the first place. But things have a context. The context is understood. We don't need to state the context with every sentence because communication becomes impossible. So this is why when we communicate, when we, when we read the Qur'an, when we read the Sunnah of the Prophet even when we communicate with human beings, you can't take a word out of context. What's the context? Everything this person has said in their life. Everything this person believes in. It's impossible that if I tell you, for example, uh, you know, Kibona is my best friend. So someone says, for example, Muhammad says, so I'm not your best friend? Come on, like it's not like this. This kind of edgy approach to communication is very problematic. And this is where the Khawarij went wrong. This is where the Khawarij went wrong. So here the Prophet is saying, hold on to fasting, there is nothing like it. There's nothing like it. So the companion understood. That doesn't mean there's a competition between fasting and prayer. Oh, now someone is going to say, which is better, fasting or prayer? Salah or Psalm? There's no place in Islam for this question. There's no place in Islam for this question. We know that the prayer is the pillar. It's the most important act of worship physically, the prayer. So fasting has a special merit, but it's not, we should not start making comparisons. But the point in this hadith is that fasting takes you to Jannah. Uh, again, the Prophet ﷺ said in this beautiful hadith, which he narrates from Allah, and that makes it a hadith Qudusi, divine hadith. قال الله كل عمل ابن آدم له إلا الصيام فإنه لي وأنا أجزي به. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. Every one of the actions of the son of Adam is for him or her. You do it, you get the merit, you get the benefit. Illa siyam. Except for fasting. It's for me and I give reward for it. So that means, but someone says, so I'm praying for myself, but I'm praying for Allah. Again, what we say, don't take an edgy approach to the Quran or the Sunnah or any kind of communication. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a special place for fasting a special status for fasting that's not matched by anything else. So Allah is saying fasting is for me and I am going to reward for it. The only meaning that we should take from this hadith is that fasting is, is dear to Allah. Allah loves it so much and Allah places a huge value on fasting and He rewards for it exceptionally. That's the only meaning I should take from this. Then the Prophet says, وَالصِّيَامُ جُنَّةً And fasting is a protection. We mentioned this before. وَإِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ صَوْمِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَلَا يَرْفُثْ وَلَا يَصْخَبْ فَإِنْ سَابَّهُ أَحَدٌ أَوْ قَاتَلَهُ فَلْيَقُلْ إِنِّي مْرُؤٌ صَائِمٌ And if it's, or when it's the day one of you is fasting, let him not engage in any kind of lewdness, any kind of evil talk, any kind of evil speech. And let him not even speak Loudly or aggressively. Sakhab is some kind of clamor that you make, some kind of noise. Don't make this. That means fasting should give you this kind of serenity and calmness. So you might say, I'm not saying anything bad, but you're just speaking, for example, with Uzair, you see me, Uzair, how is everything? Why? You're right, you're good. This is Sakhab. In Arabic, this is Sakhab. You're making so much clamor and noise. Now the Prophet here is saying, when it's the day one of you is fasting, don't engage in any evil talk, any bad things, don't say any bad things. وَلَا يَسْخَبْ And do not speak loudly and aggressively, or in a vulgar fashion. Don't do this. 
فإن سبه أحد أو قاتله فليقول إني مرء صانع. If one, someone has a quarrel with you or an argument or a fight with you, the Prophet is saying, let that person say, I am a fasting person. That means don't engage. Don't engage. Disengage with respect. I am fasting. Now the scholars have differed. Should he verbalize this, say, I am fasting? Or should he say to himself, I'm fasting? As a reminder, I'm fasting, I should not engage in this. Both of them apply. Both of them apply. If there's a need that you communicate this to that person, I'm fasting today, so I'm not engaged in, I'm not engaged in this. Or you can say it as a reminder to yourself, I'm fasting today, let me not get involved in any of this. I don't want to waste, or don't, I don't want to lose the virtues or the reward of my fasting. والذي نفس محمد بيده لا خلوف فم الصائم أطيب عند الله من ريح المسك. The Prophet is saying, by the one in whose hand my soul is, by Allah, the smell that comes out of the mouth of the fasting person is sweeter with Allah subhanahu wa taala than the, than the smell of musk. And musk doesn't necessarily mean the musk that we know today, by the way. Misk in the Arabic language, the word misk, it means the most beautiful fragrance. The most beautiful fragrance. But then people later on loved certain fragrances or certain perfumes and they started calling them musk. But the musk that the Arabs knew, it comes originally from one type of deer. They extract it from a gland within, you know, in, I believe in the neck or the chest of a deer. So that's the only specific type that is called misk in Arabic, or specific fragrance. But any beautiful smell in Arabic at the time of the Prophet used to be called misk, which we call in English, English musk. So the, uh, the Prophet is saying that the smell that comes out, we know when you don't eat and drink, there is that some kind of smell, unpleasant smell that comes out of your mouth. And doesn't come from the mouth, it actually comes from, from your stomach. Comes from your stomach. So, this kind of smell, because people usually find it unpleasant, but it is with Allah sweeter than musk. Why? Because of the cause of it. The cause of it is such a great act. You see how much Allah loves fasting? That even this unpleasant smell that comes out of your mouth, with Allah it is sweeter than, than musk. Why? Because it, the cause of it is fasting. It's such a great act of worship. And basically, subhanAllah, love, you know, when you love someone, you start to love some of their traits even if you originally hate such traits. There are people who have a sense of humor or people who are sarcastic, let's say. That you don't like, you don't like sar sarcasm. But if you happen to fall in love or admire a person who, ha who is sarcastic, you'll be surprised that you will start to like sarcasm. Specifically when it comes from that person. That's how we humans, we're not completely logical. We have a lot of bias. We have a lot of bias. So, uh, uh, there's something, there's, something uh, there's a line of poetry, one, uh, one Bedouin, he, 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 loved, he fell in love with a woman. So what he said, because he wants to express how much he loves her, so he says, أُحِبُّهَا وَتُحِبُّنِي وَيُحِبُّنَا قَتَهَا بَعِيرِي he says, I love her and she loves me. And my camel loves her camel. So that shows that when humans, like, obviously when we love, we love whatever trait is associated with what we love, usually. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though to us this smell is unpleasant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His greatness, because of how much He loves fasting, He even loves that smell that comes out of the mouth. Now the scholars have argued, should we like strive to get this smell or should we strive to remove it since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves it? That's a dispute. It's a beautiful dispute among the scholars. But uh, from an usuli, usul fiqh perspective, the strongest opinion says no. This smell comes accidental. So even though Allah loves it, He loves it because of the fasting. So the love goes to the fasting first and foremost. So you should not strive to keep it. You can eliminate it with using the miswak. 
was you with using and the prophet sallallahu there's nothing that came from him nothing authentic that came from him that he prohibited using the miswak during fasting so you can use the miswak during fasting you can use the miswak during fasting so the uh, what i would say according to uh, to my personal view the strongest opinion among the scholars is that yes you should use the miswak and not keep, not necessarily keep that smell if it comes out fine fine but it's not intended by and in itself then the prophet sallallahu says the sa'imi farhatan this is the same hadith the sa'imi farhatan yafrahuma idha aftara fariha wa idha laqi rabbahu fariha bi sawmih for the fasting person there are two moments of joy when he opens his fast at maghrib he's happy because fulfillment such a great act of worship for allah I've done it for Allah and Allah loves it. So that's a sense of achievement, fulfillment. So this is beautiful. By the way, this is a profound sense of joy. Most of us don't pay attention to it. Enjoy it. Enjoy that moment and live it fully. Experience it. Experience it. The second moment of joy, the Prophet ﷺ says, إِذَا لَقِيَ رَبَّهُ فَرِحَ بِصَوْمِهِ And when he or she meets their Lord, they are happy and joyous with their fast. Why? Because... When you meet Allah, you're going to see the consequences. That's, that means the moment your death, of your death, the moment your soul leaves your body, you're going to feel this. You're going to feel this joy. And the moment you meet Allah on the day of judgment, you're going to feel this joy. Why? Because of the rewards that you're going to see in front of you because of fasting these days. So that shows that fasting is a profound investment. With, uh, with us. There's a narration in Bukhari, um, that is connected to this hadith as well. It's an addition so, where the Prophet uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when he talks about إِلَّا الصَّوْمْ فَإِنَّهُ لِي وَأَنَا عَزِيبِهِ He says, each action you do is for you except for fasting is for me and I reward for it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says يَتْرُكُ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ وَشَهْوَتَهُ مِنْ أَجْلِ أَصْصِيَامُ لِي وَأَنَا أَجْزِيبِهِ وَالْحَسَنَةُ بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهَا He says, my servant abstains and leaves, leaves off his food and his drink and his desire for me. For me. Fasting is for me and I reward for it and each good deed will be rewarded ten times over. There is a narration in uh, Sahih Muslim where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says in the same hadith, same divine hadith, كُلُّ عَمَلِ بْنِ آدَمَ يضعف. Each of the actions of the son of Adam will be multiplied. And we know the Prophet ﷺ said each hasana will be multiplied to ten times. Al hasanatu bi ashri amthaliha ila sab'i mi'ati dhaif. So each action that you do will be multiplied ten times over up to seven hundred times over. Up to seven hundred times over. Qala Allah ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, illa sawm, except for fasting. This 10 times over to 700 times over does not apply to fasting. It's for me and I reward for it. What does this mean? It means it's even multiplied more. It, it breaks the rule, the rule with all the good deeds. Okay, so these are enough merits of fasting. Inshallah, tomorrow we will uh, talk more about the merits of fasting. This should serve to encourage us that when we fast, we fast, we, we have what we call istihdar al niyyah we have our intention for Allah. Seeing all these merits and all these rewards and benefits for fasting should actually encourage us to fast in with more of, I would say, with a present heart. With a present heart. So your heart is present when you're fasting and your intention is strong and clear that you are doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me take, if there are any questions, inshallah, we can take some. Any questions? Fadl uh, one time I was uh, on my computer and uh, I was going to search the health benefits of fasting. Well, I think I came across the website. But I said to myself, uh, let me not pollute my intention. You know, I don't want to do it for, I don't want to know about health benefits. I want to do it for Allah. So uh, was that correct? Or? Okay, that's a good question. So the question is, um, I was checking a website that talks about the health benefits of fasting. Then I stopped myself, right? And I said to myself, no, because I don't want to pollute my intention. I want to do it for Allah regardless of the health benefits. Because obviously it seems there is some kind of fear that if I read these benefits, 
that they will hijack my intention, that I'll be fasting for the sake of the health benefits. Either fully or partly, at least, I'll be fasting for these health benefits. What I would say, each person is different. Each person is different. Um, but if you felt, that depends on your self-knowledge, if you feel that this is, might hijack your intention to a certain extent, it might be the good thing, I mean, you made a good decision not to look into them. But each person is different. How you take these benefits, how you relate to them, okay, defines whether it's better for you to look into them or just ignore them. So, it's different among different people. So I cannot give a, an answer for all. Uh, it depends on how much control you have over your intention. But I would say ideally, generally speaking, they shouldn't take your intention away. They should still, I mean, that's good. They might even intensify and strengthen your intention to realize, to see, subhanAllah, when Allah commands us to do something for Him, it's not, it's also, it helps us even on, on, on the health, uh, or health-wise. They help us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hakim. So that probably, some, with some people, this might intensify their intention and strengthen it. It depends how you relate to it. But also, there's something very important about intention. The scholars have a qaida or a fiqhi maxim. They say, Al-iktisab la yunafi al-ihtisab. Al-iktisab la yunafi al-ihtisab. They say, getting some worldly benefit does not necessarily go against pure intention for Allah. Pure intention for Allah. And this is why, the people who take part in jihad, proper jihad, when they take part in jihad, they get spoils of war. Does this destroy their intention? It shouldn't. But there are people who fall into this, who start fighting for the spoils of war, for the rewards. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, He made that a legislation that people who take part in this uh, battle and they defend Islam, they get sh their share. So ideally, it shouldn't, it shouldn't. So getting some kind of benefit from what you do for the sake of Allah should not compromise your intention. But with some people that might find it problematic, be on the safe side. Yeah, it's your call, yeah. Uh, the intention of every night, yeah. uh, there's some opinion of saying, I mean, as soon as Ramadan comes, yeah. you can make one intention. Yes, there is this, uh, there is this, okay, just have an intention for, for Ramadan. The thing is, intention is all about being conscious that I'm fasting to, tomorrow. That's all. That's what we call istihbar al I mean, you already have the intention, but istihbar. Istihbar meaning bringing it, bringing it to, your, to the consciousness, to your awareness. It is the safest opinion to have this kind of awareness every night. It is better, otherwise we might fall into a habit. Okay, we're just going through the motions. So it is the safest. That's, that's why I recommended it, yes. Wafi kabarak. Questions? Tfadda. Time table, right? We have different time tables. For? For Ramadan. Okay. For Salah. Like, Fajr time, 4.05, if you follow up. If I have my iPhone, it shows 5.10 yeah. or 4.10. So different timetable, yeah. which one should I follow? Okay, for, for iftar, for maghrib, all seem to be agreed, like it's one or two minutes difference. So that's not, it's not a big deal. Uh, in terms of uh, yeah, the timetable, there are, unfortunately, because there, is, there are interpretations of what, for example, al-fajr means, what al-khayt al-abyad, was al-fajr al-sadiq and al-fajr al kadib the true fajr, dawn, and the sort of fake or false Fajr. So there is a, a disagreement among the scholars. As far as I know, and this is not, I hope this will not be taken as propaganda, uh, I believe what we follow here is something that has been tested by a very strong student of knowledge, a person of knowledge, who tests, tested these, okay, and they put them uh, based on this. Uh, and I believe it's taken from the Quran and Sunnah. Uh, so it's done according to a correct method. So what I would recommend is here you ask the Imam that you trust. But if you follow one, like one timing or one method, don't you know, criticize the other methods. Like you have two brothers at the same, ho uh, same house, one says, okay, um, uh, one of them prays at one masjid, the other prays at another masjid, I'm following my Imam here, I, I trust them. Fine, perfect. The other one, 
they break the, or they, they, uh, they, for them, Fajr is a bit earlier, let's say 10, 15 minutes earlier. He can't say, oh, you have no fast for the other one. No. We have to respect each other here. This difference is okay, inshallah. So we don't make a big deal out of it. But don't switch like You have to, uh, the, the issue is switching on what basis a person is switching. The same thing with fatwa. Why one day you ask this sheikh, the other day you ask another sheikh? Why? What's the, any average Muslim who don't have Islamic knowledge, practically speaking, they should have a teacher or an imam who they believe to be upon the, the sunnah, who strives to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu who strives to follow the truth regardless. And they have knowledge, or at least they have a good level of knowledge and they are connected to the scholars. And you trust their religiosity and they, they would give you something that, is, that they believe is true. That's a person that you should take fatwa from, including what's the time for Fajr, or what's the time for Maghrib. You take from them, and that's it. Until you become a student of knowledge, then there will be more options, but at this stage, you have to take, because Allah SWT says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ So ask the people of knowledge when you do not know, if you do not know. So ask one person that you trust, and you believe they strive to arrive at the truth, that's the person you ask. That's the only practical way. Other than that, it's just playing with religion. You will find it, it's, it will be impractical. Even someone who says, I follow this madhab, or I follow that madhab, regardless. You're not following the madhab, you're following one scholar within a madhab. Because even within the same madhab, they will find differences among the scholars. Yeah. So ask, ask the, as I said, the imam that you trust, or the scholar that you trust, that you usually seek for fatwa. And keep him as that one person. That's for the awam, that's for the layman, Muslim layman. Any more questions? Can take one more if there is. If not, okay. Barakallahu feekum wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.